I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, the person with the initials DF to unmute. DF, if you can go ahead and unmute, what's your question for Dr. William Lee? Hi, Dr. Lee. Thanks for the presentation. That was awesome. I, my question is about IGF-1. I read something that IGF-1 promotes uh, cell growth, uh, unfortunately, uh, cancer cell growth. Uh, is there any IGF-1 in plant foods or does it matter whether it's the amount in, in whatever food? Uh, what matters is what our liver, uh, how much our liver produces. So um, thank you. Yeah, so, well, first of all, um, thank you for that question. And um, I'm, not, I'm not able to give medical advice um, uh, in, in this context, but uh, I will tell you that IGF-1 uh, is actually insulin growth factor one for everyone. And it's actually a body that, uh, it's actually a, a protein that our body naturally produces as part of health. Even though we read about it and hear about it and it's actually lectured about as sort of something that's overproduced and a target for treating disease, in fact, it's incredibly important. Um, it, it's involved with insulin regulation, so it's involved with the metabolism. And yeah, it's involved with cell growth. Our body is able to control levels of IGF-1, um, and we want to keep our body's ability to control IGF-1 um, at its normal level. Uh, foods don't really have human IGF-1. Human, It's a human protein, so um, foods actually don't have enough of it to activate us. But Foods that can kind of influence our gut bacteria can actually influence our lipids and our lipid metabolism and our fat in our body can actually produce IGF-1. So this is a kind of the connection between the foods we eat, mostly plant-based, high fiber, whole foods actually can help our gut microbiome, which then helps control our lipids, which then interacts with our fat and adipose tissue, which then helps to smooth out what our IGF-1 uh, does. We don't want to get rid of most of these proteins. We want to keep them in balance. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And up next, we have Deb. Deb, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself for Dr. William Lee. Yes, hi, Dr. Lee. I really enjoyed your book, Eat to Beat Disease, and I'm a big, a big fan. Um, I had a question with regard to ivermectin relating to COVID and what your thoughts are. Right, so the question is, um, again, I'm not giving, I'm not able to give medical advice, but you know, everybody's looking for a COVID treatment. I mean, from day one, um, whether you're a researcher like me or people in government or drug companies or, you know, people who um, uh, are out there, you know, cleaning out drugstore shelves and dietary supplements. Um, interestingly, ivermectin is a medicine that shows a lot of promise. Um, uh, and it actually seems to work by interfering with the binding of the virus to its receptor ACE2. It also lowers inflammation. And the reason it got to be interesting was because many people who were suffering a infection like with Lyme disease are treated with ivermectin. Um, this is repurposed in treating long-term and chronic Lyme disease and they actually seem to improve. And so there were lots of smaller studies um, being done. Lots of people were taking ivermectin. Doctors were writing iver ivermectin prescriptions and clinical trials are actually being um, done uh, as, as well um, as you probably know uh, from everything you've been reading about COVID, um, running clinical trials is really, really difficult because we don't even know exactly how to uh, get the same patients at the same place and at the same time to figure out um, how to actually get a really good control group. But ivermectin is a pretty safe drug. I mean, you know, like um, if you have a pet dog, your the dog's vet um, gives ivermectin to control heartworm, for example. And so it's one of those um, really interesting areas um, that the FDA has also taken an interest in, in a positive way to ask, are there drugs that can be repurposed that are inexpensive? And if you think about what's going on today around the world, like in India and in other parts of the world, I heard from a colleague in Turkey today, um, their case rate is also going out of control. They don't have all the bells and whistles that we are fortunate to have here. How can we actually find affordable, inexpensive, safe medications or interventions that can be helpful to them. And that's actually where um, applying the science to things like ivermectin uh, are important. Now, just to put a, a footnote on there, don't forget hydroxychloroquine also was sort of a savior drug at one point. It takes science and it takes time to really sort all this out. Thank you for asking the question. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Up next, we have Cheryl. Cheryl, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Cheryl. 
Hi, thank you, Ben. Hi, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for all you do. I have your list of cancer fighting foods on my refrigerator. And my question is, is it ever too late to use these foods as cancer treatment? For example, if somebody's 85 and they have double hit lymphoma and they've been on chemo for a year already, is it too late to try a dietary intervention with the foods that you recommend? Yeah, so the question really is, you know, um, is there a point at which foods are not going to be useful in helping to prompt our body uh, to resist cancer, to control blood vessels growing to the cancer? Um, so anti-androgenesis starving the cancer, targeting the stem cells from which cancers, including lymphomas, can grow, um, uh, get right-sizing our gut microbiome so the ecosystem is able to lower inflammation, which can provoke cancer, um, protect our DNA from having more mutations because cancer is driven from by mutations, and also to help support our immune system so that even if we are elderly and even if we're battling cancer, even if we've had treatment, our immune system is still working on our side. Um, we, haven't sent, we haven't dismissed them, we haven't sent them home if they're still uh, ready to rock and to help us defend against the disease. And the answer is you are never too old to use nutrition to fortify your body's defenses. That is the one thing that never gives up is our, our body's uh, defenses. One thing is that they can get weaker as we get older and they can even get weaker with some treatments like chemo. So that's double the reason to actually try to eat the foods that can help support them. I, and I wanna underscore what I am saying is not to replace cancer treatments that your doctor might prescribe um, uh, using food, but rather to use food as something that you can help yourself with at a nutrition level to support your health defenses between doctor's office visits. Thank you for asking.